Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for another AppSAD Insight webinar. My name is Jim Hunt. I'm a nurse educator here at Insight. Um, I've been for a few years now and uh, regularly presenting this. Today we're going to be talking about a subject which is something that most clinicians are probably aware of, but it's not something that we have come through our doors on a regular basis, or I should say the clients coming through our doors aren't generally seeking support with the substances that we're going to be talking about today as their primary drug of concern, which I think might be something that as services we may need to consider how we, how we manage that in the future. So I'm hoping today's webinar is going to be a useful one. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're presenting today. I'd like to extend my uh, respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I'd like to also extend that welcome and respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us out there in webinar land. So thank you and welcome. Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Dunn, who's a senior lecturer at Deakin University. The subject that we're going to be talking about today is performance and imaging hearts in drugs. And Matthew has about 20 years experience in uh, working alongside these substances and looking at harm reduction and associated issues with their use. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Matthew Dunn to talk to us about performance and image enhancing drugs. So over to you, Matthew, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for making me feel old, Jim. Um, thank you, everyone who has come today. Um, and to, to those of you that are watching the recording, thank you very much. Um, I know it's very easy to say that you're going to watch the recording, um, and it's very difficult to do that. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to extend my welcome, uh, my thanks to Jim and the Insight team. Um, I was saying to Jim before that this is an incredible resource that you've got. Um, I watch these, I use them in my teaching, and um, uh, they're fantastic. So I hope my presentation stacks up with all the other great ones that you've had. And I also like to thank APSAD um, as well. Um, I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I would like to um, extend my uh, acknowledgement of country. Of, my thanks to um, First Nations pe people, past, present and emerging. I'm working at home. I'm in um, Victoria. I'm in Melbourne. I've been in lockdown for about uh, bar three week period, about seven months. Um, so this is the first time in about four months I've worn a collared shirt. Um, so I am working at home. I am on Wi-Fi. I'm going to turn my video off um, just so there's no um, clunkiness there, but I am still here. Um, we're going to save questions for the end because I'm really hoping that we can do some um, interactive stuff uh, later on because this presentation isn't meant to be me talking at you. Um, I want to be starting um, a dialogue. So uh, this presentation starts from a presentation I gave in 2018 um, here in Melbourne. And I'd like to extend my thanks to Suzanne Fraser and her team uh, for inviting me to that forum. And the topic was the health of paid users. What do they want? Where do they want it? And how? And this is the start of my thinking about um, how we can talk to this group, um, how we can um, engage them in services, whether they sometimes want to or not, or at least extend um, that branch to them to engage when they want to, um, and they do want to. That It's, it's um, a bit of a slight myth that this group don't actually want to engage with um, the health professions, uh, they do. And I think there's ways that we can do that. Um, and so this really got me starting to think about um, how we can do some of this. And that's what my presentation is going to be about today. It won't be data. I'm not presenting from a study or anything like that. Um, so if that's what you came for, um, sorry. Uh, but if you are happy to sit back um, and just listen for a little bit and then we can talk, then um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you as well. I should also say that Richard Henshaw is on, on the line. He's from Queensland Health. He knows more about this topic than I do, um, and he'll be around later on as well to, to, um, to share the Q&As. So I'm really conscious. Um, we were at, I was at ABSAD last year um, in uh, Hobart, and we, myself, Katinka van der Ven, and Ben Yu, uh, some of you may know both or, or one of them, uh, we did a, a bit of training around this topic, um, PED users, and we always assume that people know more about it than what they do, and that's completely fine. Um, we had people coming just saying, look, what are, what are these drugs? Um, because it could be the first 
the second or the tenth time that you've engaged with someone at your service, um, whether you're an NSP worker or an AOD worker or a GP or anything else um, that comes into contact with people who use substances. So I am just for a very brief moment going to just take a step back, define what I'm talking about and then move forward. Um, because I know that a lot of you probably come into contact with people who are using things like uh, uh, cocaine, opioids, cannabis and alcohol. You may not be seeing people that are using these particular substances, uh, but you probably um, know that at some point you will be uh, if you're not already. So what do I mean? Um, performance and or image enhancing drugs is a broad term that encapsulates substances used to enhance performance or image, and usually we, we mean body image. When we talk about these substances, um, and there's a couple of different acronyms that float around, um, the British use IPED, so image and performance enhancing drugs. I think the Americans are using appearance and performance related drugs. They all mean the same thing. Um, it can be things like your good old multivitamin um, that I can walk over to the pharmacy and I'm pointing that way because that's where it is in my area um, and buy, um, buy a multivitamin at supermarket or the pharmacist, no problem. Some of the other ones are things like creatine or branch chain amino acids or BCAAs and I can walk to the supplement store that's one block that way and I can buy those and a myriad range of other substances that are going to do who knows what? Um, I'm not convinced that everyone who takes these substances know what they do. Um, full disclosure, I do take creatine and BCAAs and I do know what they do. Um, but, you know, you go into the supplement store and you can be sold a whole bunch of things. Uh, and then we have things like anabolic androgenic steroids, and I'm going to just refer to them as steroids moving on. Um, and there are a range of other substances, and I'll touch upon them in a couple of slides. The most research regarding the non-medical use is the steroids. Um, so we sometimes interchangeably talk about steroids when we're talking about peds, um, and we talk about peds when we, 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 mean, we mean steroids, and I'm probably going to do that today, I do apologise. Um, but it is really the case that when you come into contact with people that are using these substances, um, the harms are going to come from things like the steroids and other um, uh, those prescribed substances. And I'm really, I am emphasizing that I'm talking about non medical use. Um, there's a paper that came out in 2011 from Bryony Lawrence um, looking at definitions, things like use, abuse, non medical use, non adherent use, all those things. It's in Drug and Alcohol Review. It's a fantastic paper because um, as we've done research into substance use, we know that things aren't just black and white. Um, we know that there's uh, a lot more shades of grey um, in when people talk about what they use, why they use it, and the behaviours that sit around that. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you here today probably come into contact with people like that. For example, people that might both be prescribed um, opioid substitution um, therapy, methadone or buprenorphine, might talk about how they use their dose um, on days that they're not feeling great, but sometimes they're feeling good, but their partner isn't and they're not on methadone or buprenorphine so they might share their their dose so we we might categorize that a certain way but it's that shade of gray and we we know that with steroids as well steroids and a lot of those other performance and image enhancing drugs like growth hormones have legitimate therapeutic uses um, and you, many of you will know that. Um, and so when we talk about non-medical use, we are referring to people that might be using it for um, athletic or some sort of sporting or performance reason, but also for body image, um, but also they may have been prescribed it. Um, and so uh, we see when we're talking to mostly the men who use it, because it is predominantly men who um, use these substances, that there are different reasons for it and they cross over. And I will touch upon that um, in a little bit. Um, so I am talking about the non-medical use. I'm not really referring to people that have been prescribed it, but just remember that some people may have been prescribed it for a legitimate medical reason, but are seeing some other benefits um, from taking it. So what do I mean when I'm talking about the steroids? There are really kind of two types of the steroids. There are the ones that are going to help you put on muscle mass. And there are ones that are going to that, that bulk, that size. Um, and there are ones that are going to help you put on the lean muscle mass. Um, I make the distinction kind of when you're thinking about body types 
that one is maybe your NRL player or your rugby union player. Um, that's that bulk, that size. Um, and then there are the ones that are more like the AFL player, that lean um, muscle um, physique. Um, if you ever come into contact with people that are using steroids, have a chat with them um, about what they're using and why, if you can get them to stop for more than five seconds, um, because they are a highly knowledgeable group um, and they will uh, tell you all about it and what they're doing and why they're using it. Um, the, the first group here on the screen are the bulking ones. Um, they'll put on the mass, the muscle mass. Um, so you have methandrostenolone, um, which is uh, their tablets. Uh, go by names such as Dianabol, Danabol, or Avabol. Um, up the top, you've got Oxymethylone, um, which goes by the name of Anadrol, which is also a tablet. Um, and then there you have the um, testosterone enethate uh, that is an injectable steroid. So these, as I said, multiple times now, are going to put on the bulk. A lot of that is going to be, uh, there is going to be that muscle size, uh, but it, these ones are going to... Um, create uh, water retention um, and maybe an increase in um, fat as well. The second uh, group are the lean muscle mass ones. So on the right there, at uh, the left, sorry, you've got the injectable one, which is uh, nandrolodecanate, um, decadurabolin, or just deca. Um, you've got anivar at the top, which is a oxandrolone, which is a tablet, um, as well as denozolol. Um, which goes by names of Winstrol, which is also a tablet. Um, so these ones are going to be the ones that will give you that leaner physique. Um, a question that I often get asked about steroids is, do they work? Um, yes, because people take them and we can see that they work. Um, but they don't really work if you're not doing the other things to get to your goal. So um, that's why when you talk to people that use these substances, they probably are training. Uh, they're probably um, on a very strict eating plan, um, all those types of things. But uh, these do work. These do do what it says on the tin, which is one of my favorite sayings. Um, so yeah, they work um, and people will select the different ones depending on what goal they want. There are some others that I haven't talked about today um, and uh, these are just the general ones that you probably should know, but you might come across something like um, Trembolone or, or some of the other ones. Um, as I said, uh, different people will have different uh, reasons for what they're using. Um, talking about peds, there are a range of other things that people will use. Um, as I said, right from the beginning, there are things like the multivitamin and the creatine and, and the protein powders and all that sort of stuff. But you will see people take things like peptides, um, such as growth hormone or the insulin, um, the anti-estrogens, such as Clomid. Um, you might take that if you're taking one of the bulking steroids um, and it's uh, maybe... Uh, you're getting uh, increases in fat in places such as the um, the pecs. Uh, so it's gynecomastia, which is, um, I won't use, oh, actually I will use it, bitch tits. Um, guys might see an increase in the fat um, in their pecs. Um, and so they might go onto an anti-estrogen to um, try and reverse some of those effects. Um, if you're coming up to a competition or you just want to look really good at the music festival and, um, in a couple of weeks, you might go on a diuretic. Um, or you might take one of the fat loss ones like clenbuterol, um, and there are other ones as well. Uh, so there are a range of substances that people take uh, depending on what they want to get out of it. Um, and so that's just something that to be conscious about when you're coming into co uh, contact with this group is that, um, yep, they might be taking steroids, but they might be taking a range of other things. Um, and as I said right from the beginning, there is a bit of... Um, Tension is probably not the right word, but this group doesn't like to go to health professionals. Um, they don't see themselves as substance users. Uh, so if you're seeing this group, and particularly if you're a GP or a clinician, you might be seeing them when something has gone wrong um, and they have tried to fix it themselves. So as I said, they might be bulking, they might have taken a combination of steroids, um, they're seeing an increase, let's go with the example of the pecs, um, the fat there, they've taken a um, anti-estrogen, something's gone wrong, and they finally come to you. So it's about uh, just being aware that there are a range of things that people might be taking. So what are the effects? Um, well, as I said, with, with the steroids, they, um, they will 
do what it says on the tin, and I need to stop saying that, but it will increase muscle mass, muscle strength. Um, it will do um, what people want them to do. And we've got decades worth of, of research from um, the, the people that use them that, that show that these work. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, look at him. They, they worked. He was Mr. Mr. Universe, I think, or Mr. Olympia, one of those, one of those two, if not both. So they, they do these things. But there are a range of uh, negative effects uh, that come from it that we need to be aware of. And the, the consumers themselves, and I, I sometimes use the word user and consumer and people who use, um, I, I appreciate that language is important, so I'm sorry if I offend anyone with one of those terms. Um, but consumers know that there are going to be negative side effects. That's why they have a range of substances on hand to try and mitigate the, the possible negative effects that come from it. So rather than going into the literature to talk about what we think might happen, um, we will look at, we, a couple of years ago at um, APSAD, I pulled out most of the Australian literature that had been done to date and looked at what the consumers themselves reported um, experiencing. There are some caveats before we go that. So um, no one takes just one substance. Um, they take a range of things. People will cycle on and off a substance. Um, that makes it difficult to understand what some of those negative effects might be and what is causing those. What I mean by cycle on and off is that for a period, they will take a steroid and then they'll stop for a period. So you might use something for 12 weeks um, because steroids take a little bit of time to kick in um, and get that effect. Um, and then you'll take it for the period and then you'll stop for a period. That was the kind of the old school way of doing things. Now, um, most of the guys that I come into contact with, they do what's called blast and cruise. So they will take a really large initial dose for that period. And instead of cycling off, they'll just drop that dose down um, almost to a, a maintenance phase. They do that for several reasons. Um, the body stops producing its own testosterone um, and because steroids are just a synthetic form of testosterone. Um, it stops producing it when it senses that stuff is coming in from the outside. So um, it shuts down. When you stop putting it in, it takes a while to kick back, um, your system to kick back in, and it can it varies. Some guys, it happens relatively quickly. Uh, some guys, it takes quite some time. And so you lose the things that you've gained, but also there are some of those negative effects that are on the next slide uh, that come from that. So what guys are doing are not going off it completely, they're just running almost a replacement therapy, uh, but it, it's, it's a lower dose. But the doses that these, um, these guys are taking are greater than what you would see at the therapeutic level. Um, and uh, so that also um, kind of muddies our thinking about this. Uh, so I, when I've met a lot of GPs and I, I've been doing work with um, Dr. Ben Yu, who some of you may know, um, doing patient audits, um, when, when you get medical people around a table, it's often trying to really think about what you've learned in your training that a therapeutic dose will do and what a much greater dose will do. Um, we don't have great longitudinal data about steroid use and the long-term effects. So this is my call to arms at anyone that's got money um, or knows anyone with money. Uh, we really want to do some, some work and do some longitudinal work. Um, and if you, if you want to see the benefits of longitudinal research, studies like um, from NDARC, the uh, ATOS, a, a treatment outcome study, uh, Marie Thiessen and Shane Dark and others, just seeing that data over time from that cohort um, just really fills in all those, all those gaps. And we have a lot of gaps when it comes to these substances. So what are the negative effects? Lots of things on here, I'm gonna walk you through it. There are the effects that might come from intramuscular injecting. So uh, these uh, steroids really aren't injected intravenously, um, if at all. They are intra, um, intramuscular. So we think less about the bloodborne viruses, and that's a hard thing for a lot of us to get our heads around um, because we're all trained to look at uh, that issue of bloodborne virus transmission. Um, the studies really show that it's very low. Um, if not negligible in this group. Um, that's not to say it's not an issue though, and I will talk about that a little bit late, uh, later on. So you do have things like abscesses and the sore injecting sites. You've got a lot of uh, what I call the nuisance effects, so acne. And if you ever want to kind of figure out who's using um, steroids at a gym, uh, you look for the size, um, but also acne on the back um, and shoulders is, is a bit of a giveaway. 
as well. Um, there are things like nosebleeds, but there, there are the really serious ones like liver problems, kidney problems, heart problems. I was just reading a study the other day talking about cardiovascular disease. That's one of the things that we're worried about um, because we are starting to see the guys who used back in the Arnie Schwarzenegger days now aging and what that long term, um, those long term effects might look like. Um, cardiovascular disease and the the liver are the, the ones that kind of worry worry the guys when you're talking to them, but also do worry um, uh, researchers as well. Uh, Gynecomastia I've already, already talked about. Impotence is one of the ones. Um, also in reproductive problems, and we've uh, Richard and I have done some work uh, talking to guys where they've said, look, if I if I knew that I was going to start a family in the next couple of years, I wouldn't have started um, using steroids. I said that can be a bit of a problem. Um, and the biggest one there, the end, the interference with the body's ability to produce testosterone. There are some psychological effects. And again, this is what people have told researchers that they experience. They do experience mental health issues. Um, there is self-reported aggression. This idea of roid rage is one that this group really hate. Um, but certainly they do talk about it. And it does seem to be linked to some to certain types of steroids. So Trembolone is the one that does come up where if you've got a bit of aggressive tendencies, you maybe don't take that one. Um, things like depression can occur when you come off steroids um, and the mood swings as well. So when your body's not producing testosterone and you're not putting it into your body um, and there's that deficit, we get some of these, um, these negative effects. Um, I haven't mentioned body image, but it's certainly there. Um, but I will talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, so what are, what are the main ones that you might see? Um, this is a retrospective case review of 180 patients who visited a specialised um, steroids clinic in the Netherlands. 96% of them experienced at least one side effect. Um, the most common side effects that experienced on cycle, so during that period that they're, um, they're using, maybe for 8, eight 10, 12 weeks, um, was the acne, the gynecomastia, and agitation. And the ones that, common ones that were experienced afterwards were the decreased libido and the erectile dysfunction. So if you're a clinician or someone that's coming into contact um, with these, uh, this group, these might be the main ones that you... Think about in the back of your mind, but also the ones that you might um, talk to the group about um, if they, if you, as I said, you get them for more than five minutes. Um, I, in my previous life, I worked at the National, at NDARC and I worked on the IDRS and EDRS projects. And I know that um, the steroid users are the ones that come in, grab their stuff, and go. Uh, they don't want to talk to anyone. Um, and but I think some of that, those barriers are starting to break down. And I know in Queensland, you've got um, wonderful groups doing wonderful work with this group um, and I think it might be a little bit different up there to say other parts of the country but I'm also happy to be proven wrong. So how can we talk about the life cycle and health uh, with this group? I've, I, As I said I want this to be a, a dialogue between all of us today and I'm, these are just my thoughts they're not the thoughts they're not the best ones um, we will all have our own way of thinking about this but I wanted to get that ball rolling the first way we could do it is consider the obvious phases the ones that I talked about earlier on so we could look at um, the health and harm before during and after so these are just the ones I listed right at the beginning on that slide from a previous presentation. We may engage to say before someone starts using on safer injecting practices. Um, it's, as I said, it's primarily intramuscular, but if someone is also has come to steroids from injecting other substances, or you think they might be a risk for injecting other substances once they start using steroids, then maybe that's a conversation that you might wanna have. Um, you might want to get them to think about their base, baseline health status. Um, a lot of guys do do that. They will try and get um, a full blood panel done before they start using and then during and then after. Um, and so sometimes they will go to a GP or health practitioner and say, look, I've been feeling really tired, really sluggish. Um, I don't know what's going on. Um, can you please... Um, uh, we need to get all these tests done and that might be a bit of a clue that someone's thinking about using steroids. 
um, we might get them to think about what they're actually using. What, what are they planning to use? Um, and is it just going to be steroids or are they going to be using a range of things? Um, get them to think about post-cycle therapy. Post-cycle therapy is what guys will use um, when they finish using steroids to kind of kick kickstart their natural system again. Um, it will primarily probably be um, growth hormone. Um, people have got their own uh, regimes for what they what they want to do, but getting guys to think about that before they use um, is is really important. And asking them really whether they really want to do it or not. Um, again, because I'm a steroid researcher, I get asked this a lot. People are like, oh, look, I, I was thinking about doing it or doing a couple of cycles. What do you think? And it's like, well, why do you want to do it? Is it because um, you notice that you put a few ISO kilos on um, or you want to get back in the gym and really hit it hard? Uh, I'm Tim Piekowski, um from uh, QUT. He's just uh, submitted his PhD revisions. Um, some data from his PhD work showing that young guys might turn to steroids after the breakup of a relationship. Um, so you've come out of a relationship, you want to get back on the market, so you want to look your best. Um, so what's the motivation for it? Um, and Kay Stanton, a number of you will know her, if not have heard of her, who does great work, um, has talked about sometimes just showing the guys the syringes, the equipment that they need to inject themselves will put them off uh, using. So we could do this beforehand. There might be things during, uh, so health monitoring, response to any acute harm, so any um, injecting related harms or things like gynecomastia, um, getting people referred on if you're in an NSP and someone's said that they've experienced some sort of harm, making sure they're not doing what typical men do and not going to seek harm, uh, help referring them on or just saying, look, if you have any harm, here's where you can go. Um, and again, getting guys to think, do you really want to be doing this? Um, and afterwards, again, post-cycle therapy and health monitoring. There are pros and cons to this, um, it, to this model of conceptualising health and harm. It allows us to intervene before use occurs. Um, it allows us to help the potential user to reflect on whether they want to do it and why they're doing it. Why have they picked that steroid over that one? Um, are they going to be doing something like injecting insulin, which really, really worries me. It's, it's not a huge group that do it, but I think we're seeing a bit more of that. And it, it, it's, um, gosh, it's worry, it, it worries me. Um, but it builds rapport for the rest of the life cycle. So if you're asking some of these questions in a way that is non-judgmental, it might be that they come back to you later on when they are experiencing harm. But the con is that we don't see people in these discrete periods um, and we may not have the time to engage the clients. And again, you and NSPs um, will probably be able to tell a lot of stories about the guys that come in, ask for a steroid pack and leave. Um, so they're probably already using at that point. You probably don't see them at the beginning, middle and end. And it misses the nuances that may be linked to the motivations around use. So we could consider the motivations for use in considering the, the life cycle of health and harm. So there are, traditionally I've said that there are three main reasons for using. I think there are now four. That fourth one might overlap a little bit, but that's body image, performance, occupation, and health. And I'm gonna to touch upon each of those um, just briefly. Body image, um, large volume of literature to support the notion that men have body image concerns. It's probably less the eating disorders, but it's probably more that drive for muscularity. Um, maybe moving into some of the more disordered um, disorders such as muscle dysmorphia. Um, I don't think everyone that uses steroids has a, um, an, a body image disorder um, or is um, muscle dysmorphic. Uh, nor do I think that everyone that has that will use steroids, but there is certainly evidence to see that there's a crossover. The different body types, that bulk and that muscle, that real power lifter look, um, or the increased lean body mass and the decreased body fat, as a, we've talked about the two different uh, categories of steroids there. Um, but also there's this real push for things like strength and functionality, almost that crossfit or that ninja warrior kind of body that's really functional climb up a, a, a rock climbing wall and go for a 10k run and do all these things um, you know that strength and that having a body that is really um, uh, functional and it gives increased social feedback and confidence so you look good you go out there people notice 
um, that you've lost weight or you put on size that you're a bit different. And so that may go into that loop of um, continuing. And that's kind of why um, when I'm talking to guys about using steroids, if it's for body image reasons, um, I, I might be more direct with my questions saying, right, what are your goals? And if people say, look, I just want to put on three or five kilos of, of, of size and then I'll stop, my question is, well, will you? Because I've interviewed plenty of guys over the years that haven't um, and 10, 15, 20 years later are still using them. So um, that's something that we might think of with um, conversations around this. The second is performance. So yes, elite athletes use these substances, um, but also that sub elite or that weekend warrior or the ninja warrior or however you want to conceptualize it because they do increase strength and endurance. Importantly though, they also, um, there's that recovery after intense activity or injury. Um, sport has become a lot more commercialized in this country. Sport is a career now. Um, my 14 year old nephew wants to be an AFL player. Um, when I was 14, that wasn't really an option. Um, and when my father, who was an Australian swimmer, um, was competing, he had to make a choice between sport or having a family. And he picked family, and that's why I'm here. Um, but now sport could be uh, something that you could aspire to be for a career. Um, so that's why you may choose to use this, um, these substances to just give you an edge. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. It can just be that you want to really play well at your weekend AFL match or your, your um, rugby match. Then there's occupation, and that kind of crosses over a little bit more with, some, with the other two categories. But this idea of body capital, having a body that portrays something um, to other people. So that could be... Uh, prison officers or people working in the justice system. It could be bouncers. It could be personal trainers. It could be manual labourers. It could be models. Um, this idea, um, and, as well, there's a bit of crossover and there's a lot of literature looking at steroid use and, and masculinity. Um, and so for someone that wants to portray um, a mask, the traditional masculine body um, that might be in, um, uh, in some sort of manual labouring uh, role, Looking good is also functional for your job. And I know in Queensland, I talk to a lot of NSP workers who see the tradies coming through. Um, so these are some of quotes from some of the studies. Um, that first person is a bouncer. Um, you know, if someone's 71 kilos, they think that I'm nothing and they can walk over me. But if they see me at 95 kilos, it's a completely different story. Um, and likewise, that bottom quote is from a personal trainer who has to have a body that a client might want to aspire to. Um, because you're not going to go to an overweight personal trainer. Um, they may have all the knowledge in the world, but you as a client are looking at them to look like them. Um, they, you know, the, that body capital idea again. Then there's this last one, this health, um, and it's self-medication. So um, Maya Underwood from University of Queensland presented at this at, the, um, at a symposium earlier this year, and herself, myself, and Katinka van der Ven have got a paper under review looking at this where guys just feel that they don't have enough testosterone to live the life that they want to lead. Um, and they may have gone to a GP, they may have gone to an endo, um, but the, the range and the levels of testosterone are just are so low that they can't meet that, but they truly believe that they are not living the life that they want to in terms of just a functional life. Um, so guys that might have been really active when they were young, they're now maybe in their 40s, they've got young kids, they're working, they've got a family, but they just feel absolutely tired um, and can't be the person that they want to be. That they want to be. Um, or they feel that some of their maybe mental health issues stem from not having enough testosterone. So um, the, the work that Maya's um, done showing that it's often practiced because of an inability to access it, um, testosterone through health practitioners who are either reluctant or unable. And I don't mean that as a criticism to you GPs and endocrinologists and anyone else that prescribes. Um, I know a lot of you um, have talked about how you just don't have the scope to be able to do that because if you prescribe something um, and Medicare picks it up, you get a call from the government. Um, and that puts you in a situation that you don't want to be in. Um, and most of the guys that we talk to, they do understand that. Um, but it could also be self-medication because of price, ease of access, reliability of supply, 
um, or they've gone to a health practitioner who hasn't really understood it um, and so they just believe that they can do it themselves. So are there pros and cons at looking at this model as well? So it allows for a more tailored intervention that may be related to the underlying motivation. Um, so if we know that someone's using it because of body image purposes, we might, in the back of our mind, start thinking about some of the issues that they may encounter. You might have a better in with a person. So if you notice that someone is bulking up, then maybe they're training for a, uh, for a competition or a or a shoot or something like that, a, a modeling shoot, fitness modeling. Um, and so that could be a way that you engage with someone. Um, different workforces may see different groups. So the GPs may see someone because they're coming in saying they've got low testosterone. That could be a health thing. Um, and you can talk to them from that point of view. Um, AOD workers may see someone coming from a different point of view, counselors likewise. And we can cover the whole life cycle at one point. So you can talk to someone about why they've started, what they're going to do and how they might um, round it up or finish um, or if they've even got plans for that. The cons are that motivations overlap. Um, and so the person that is using it for health reasons that has been prescribed might get some body image um, benefits from that. Um, so how do we deal with that? Also, they may not disclose their motivations to each person they encounter. The GP may hear about the low testosterone. Um, the NSP worker may hear that they might be injecting other, substance, other illicit substances. The personal trainer might be in their ear saying, hey, have you thought about using some growth hormone? Um, so uh, not everyone discloses everything to everyone. And these motivations may be even more nuanced than what I've prescribed or I've talked about. So the third way and the final way that we could talk about this is consider who uses these substances. Um, this is from Renee Zarnow's work, um, which is based off of some work from um, some Danish researchers looking at types, uh, the typology of users. So um, the research kind of comes up with these four. There's this uh, YOLO group or the only, uh, you only live once group who are younger. They use the oral steroids, but they have higher alcohol levels and binge drinking. Uh, but they have fewer adverse effects from their steroid use. There's the wellbeing group who mostly use steroids, fewer types of steroids and moderate alcohol and other illicit drug use, again, with fewer um, adverse effects. There's the athlete who are using oral and injectable steroids, a range of other performance and image enhancing drugs, low alcohol, but higher illicits um, and more adverse effects. And then you have the expert who has fewer steroid types, uses other um, peds, but rarely drinks or uses illicit, and again, few adverse effects. So there's a little bit of crossover there, but we've got these kind of four distinct groups. There are pros and cons with this as well. It allows for a more tailored intervention that may be related to the person. So young person, right, you might think, okay, so they're gonna maybe have um, higher alcohol, so that might be a way that I can reduce harm in that group is, talking to the young trader that comes in, hey, what are your alcohol levels like? Are you, are you still drinking the way you were drinking beforehand? And knowing the type may allow us to tailor the advice based on what they're using. So um, are they that expert group? They might be using uh, more steroids, so um, we can talk to them about that. Are they using injectable, uh, injectable versus oral ones and the different effects that might come from that? With the oral steroids, the liver is particular, something that you might be concerned about. The cons are that people are greater than the sum of their parts. Um, and so we know from some research from uh, Katinka van der Ven and colleagues in the NSP study that we're seeing an increase in young men who are using other illicits. And so that's not really captured in this typology there. Um, so we know that people do other things rather than just what the type tells us. And the types may not be generalizable as well, and going back to that point. But, when we think about how we can talk about life cycle and health, we've got all these things here that we can, we can draw upon and we can mix and match all of these things based on who we are seeing at our um, NSP, our facility, our clinic, our whatever it is that you're working at. Um, and when we may have people here today that I'm not even um, touching upon like uh, physiotherapists or personal trainers or, or anyone like that. So we can mix and match some of these things to help guide us to how we can start talking about this with these groups. 
for instance, uh, someone that you're coming into contact with beforehand, before they've started, they're that YOLO group, they're young, um, they're drinking high levels and they might be using because they've just broken up with someone and they want to get it back on the market um, and put on put on a bit of size or even, even shred, um, get rid of some body fat. Um, so this provides us a point for intervention, um, possibly even prevention, as I said. Um, I, I don't care what you prescribe to, whether it's um, that no one should ever use these substances or whether can, should, people should do them safely. I think we're all here because we want to reduce harm. And sometimes that does involve prevention um, because I'm sure uh, Richard would attest to this as well. I've spoken to people that have done a couple of cycles and said, look, I really wish I didn't do that. Um, so it's about getting people to think about what they're doing. Um, and then maybe ensuring that they're linked to different services as well. So, right, you're using these substances. Um, look, I know from that presentation that I heard uh, that you might get some gynecomastia. Um, he's, he's a GP that I know will, will see people that are using steroids um, if you're ever coming into, into any um, harm. So uh, health issues such as health status testing, consideration of what peds they're going to use and so forth, um, we might target here. But we might get um, someone that's in, in a cycle, has been using for five years. They're the expert and they're using for performance reasons. So there's probably no point for intervention or prevention. Um, but you don't always have to be doing the work. So it may be a chance for you to gain some knowledge from people. And the work that we've done looking at online forum discussions, but also people, um, the interviews that we've done, they are experts on this. They know more about this than you. Um, and they are willing to give that information um, to you um, in if you're not judging them. So you might have a point of inter intervention, like I said earlier, where someone comes in, you've been seeing them for a while, they're collecting um, injecting gear, and uh, suddenly they're bigger. Um, they have to turn sideways to get through the door. Conversation started, hey, are you training for a competition? Because you're a great worker, you know that there's a bodybuilding competition on in two months' time or three months time or six months time. Are you training for a competition? Oh, what are you using? Uh, are you using uh, you know, one of the, the bulking steroids? Um, hey, listen, I'm seeing some younger guys that are coming in, can I ask your advice? And this is where you might get some information from them. Um, so as I said, I think it's about taking all of these things, mixing and matching them up um, and uh, using the different cycles the reasons people use and the types of people that use these substances to try and have a different in um, to help reduce um, harm and um, make sure health is optimised. That is the end of the presentation. But as I said from the beginning, I want this to be the start of a conversation. I want, um, and I will turn my camera on, um, I want us to have a dialogue here. I want to hear your experiences. What are you seeing um, and uh, what your thoughts are? Go for it, Jim. I'm happy to take questions. And you're on mute. Thank you, Matthew. I clicked on it and obviously had my mouse in the wrong place. So thank you for that really excellent presentation and a very useful one. Um, and certainly we have or we have several questions that I'm going to run through, if that's okay with you. And as you, as you rightly said, we do have Richard Henshaw, who's some, also an expert in this area, I, was, I would be so bold as to suggest, who works for Queensland Health. So thank you for joining us, Richard, and for agreeing to engage in the question section at the end. Thank you for that. Um, the first question, hopefully, is a nice, easy one. You cited a paper at the beginning of your presentation, which is in Drug and Alcohol Review. We've had a few people ask about this. Is it possible you could just give us either the author or the title, if you know that? Yeah, sure. So the first author is Bryony Larence. Surname is L-A-R-A-N-C-E. Uh, Bryony is B-R-I-O-N-Y. Um, it was published, I think, in 2011 in Drug and Alcohol Review. Um, and you'll you'll see the you'll see the title of give it away. It's 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 about terminology and whatnot. It, it's a great paper. And look, my email's there. If you can't find it, um, it's illegal for us to share stuff. But you know what? We're all mates. So um, just flick I me like your style. Thank you. <laughs> I'm more than happy to to share that as well. It's a great paper, and it just 
again, I, I anyone that's new to, to this topic of drug and alcohol, um, I get them to read because I think it does just tease out some of that shades of grey about why people do what they do. Perfect. I know what I should be reading this afternoon. Thank you. Um, next question, hopefully another simple one. Uh, does performance and in image enhancing drugs, i.e. the PEDS, uh, an acronym, does that include nootropics? Is that included in that field or is that kind of a separate thing? <sighs> Look, I, I wouldn't include it there, but I guess it depends on what you're talking about performance. So one of my other research streams is around um, cognitive enhancement or study drugs, those types of things. And I'm also moving into the field of um, longevity and ageing and how these substances are used for that. So look, I, I don't think you would see a, a bodybuilder walking um, saying that they're using nootropics, but... Sure. This group in the past have said that they use GHB to help promote uh, getting to that uh, sleep um, okay. cycle that promotes muscle growth. Um, some still say that they do that. It's, a, it's an older thing. Um, I think um, uh, Chanel talked about that when she presented a couple of weeks ago on GHB. Um, go watch that recording. It's a great talk. Um, so, look, who knows what they're using and why sometimes, but um, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't put this into it. Richard, would you? Okay. No, nah, look, it, it pops up in some of the literature, but um, no, I, I generally don't classify the new tropics as part of P's at all, no. Perfect, thank you. Well, uh, this question may be more for Richard, um, I'm not sure, um, but somebody's asked what the people actually call these drugs. You know, if somebody was coming in uh, and during a conversation with an AOD clinician, do they, and this might be a naive question, but it's not something I've engaged much with, unfortunately, weak crime. Do they refer to them as steroids? Do they call them slang names? How does how would I know if someone was referring to one of these substances? <laughs> yeah, look, they, they do have slang names. I guess they, they're never going to walk in and call them performance and image enhancing drugs. Yeah, that was, that was um, you know the old the old terminology was androgenic anabolic steroids. Um, often they will come in and, and say, even with our local clinics, they will say that you know they're using steroids. That's generally the, the terminology, but I guess among among all the the fellas out there, they'll use other slings. Uh, I mean, obviously you've you've heard the roid terminology, but you know they'll be on then on the gas, um, yeah. all that sort of stuff. But generally, when they're presenting, they often use the terminology steroids. I find anyway. Perfect. Thank you. Um, a lot of the uh, kind of negative effects, for want of another word. Um, were they seemed kind of uh, male specific, so gynecomastia, erectile dysfunction, uh, lowering of testosterone. Are there, do women get uh, different presentations as in negative effects? How, you know, what tends to be the issues that women would face if, if they're using these substances? Um, look, Richard? Yeah, look, I, I deal with a, a lot of women, uh, I guess, they are more in the competing arena um, and they really need to understand that um, they're making changes to their body in a big way. Even if they, they try to take the less androgenic drugs so they don't get a lot of those virilizing effects. So we're talking increased body hair, uh, even some sort of facial changes, deepening of the voice is a very common one. And then the sexual organs as well can change. And even though they try to use the less androgenic drugs, if they take them for prolonged periods and, and don't get off of them when these changes start to happen, they do become permanent. So it is a big issue with, with the ladies. I mean, men have their own problems as, as sure. uh, Matthew's talked about, uh, but uh, the women face some very life altering um, considerations when they want to turn to these, these, these medications and, and drugs. Yeah. And Thank Richard you. and I, when we did a study a couple of years ago, probably five years ago now, we, Richard interviewed a couple of women who started steroids because they were thinking about competing or they were going to compete and came off them really quickly. Um, I think probably too quickly for them to have actually had um, had real any effect, but um, they certainly didn't like what they thought the steroids were doing to them in terms of that more masculizing um, effects because that's what testosterone does. I mean, we all have it. Men just happen to have it more. Um, and so... Um, yeah, I, but a, a, a plug, I think right at the beginning on the slide, I said that I was a member of the Human Enhancement Drug Network. Um, if you Google that, you'll find our website and a whole bunch of resources. Uh, we're doing an upcoming newsletter focusing specifically on women um, and, and enhancement drugs with some um, researchers uh, talking about what they come into contact with. Um, and Kay Stanton's also present, um, going to be providing some stuff. So um, sign up to that, that website and get the newsletters 
because we know that women, we don't focus on them enough. Um, and some of you may be seen them as clients. I would definitely, just to add to that, I would definitely as a, a, a clinician uh, stress to any women coming in considering or taking anabolic steroids to get the point across that um, they may be making some lifelong changes to their, their body. Um, it doesn't matter, as I said, it doesn't matter whether they think they're taking safer options. It, it often can be a, a, a time, a time, a matter of time of how long they're on or off or how many cycles they do. Um, fortunately, for some of those ones that Matthew just, just mentioned, they're only on very short periods, so they didn't experience too much of that and it's not permanent. And often if they start to notice some signs and symptoms and get off straight away, it's not permanent, but a lot of the time that it is once they continue. Perfect. And I guess that feeds nicely into the next question that we've got here. So if uh, somebody was coming in and they were wanting to bulk up, um, but wanting to avoid going down that road, route, what would you recommend as a way of bulking without foods, without performance enhancing drugs? Um, I think we should probably have a, uh, comment for this as well but usually when I when I get asked and being a drug researcher I get asked a lot of things about drugs but particularly with steroids it's it's really about why are you doing it and will you be able just to not to, to come off when you say you will so some people will have plans um and they're like right I I want to this is my goal um and so it's about pushing back and saying well do you think you will do you think you'll get to that point and and make that decision to stop and do, or do you have anyone in your life that if you were using a steroid and you became a little bit aggro, that they could say, hey mate, stop, um, or something's going, something's happening here. And if the answer to that is no, then probably I would say, you say, look, don't start. Yeah. Sometimes when, when guys, particularly I think younger guys, um, they will say, look, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not seeing the gains in the gym. And so I'm gonna go on steroids. It's like, well, Ask them about their training and their nutrition because it's often if you're eating the same thing and doing the same exercises for the same sets and the same reps, um, nothing's going to change. Our body likes to be um, at, at equilibrium is not the right word, but it likes to adapt and then kind of do what it's doing. And if you want to get bigger, you've really got to, you've got to push your body. Um, so it's about going, look, you've been doing t three sets of 10 push-ups for a year. No wonder you're not seeing anything. So Maybe do something different, Richard. Jim, was the question alternative to using steroids? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess my, my background as well, uh, many years ago, is sports physiology. So if you look at the, the science, I think some of your main ergogenic aids today stand, still stand true. And that's um, Matthew mentioned earlier in the presentation, creatine's very um uh, very well researched um, yep. supplement that does help with performance and increases um, muscle mass through a few different ways. Um, if you're not getting enough protein in your diet, um, there are some studies that do lead to, you know, some sort of gains with adding protein in as well. But creatine to me is probably, probably the, the leader in, in all those sort of ergogenic aids. Yeah. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, somebody's asked me, it's entirely up to you if you want to answer this, Matthew. Um, what do you personally find useful about using BCAAs? Oh, um, look, I'm going to, the caveat is that I don't have a science degree or anything like that, but from the research that I've done, it does help um, with recovery, um, much like creatine does. Um, sure. And if I'm on a lower carb diet, look, none, none of you can see underneath here, but I, I have been in isolation for, for some time. So my body isn't what it was in January. But um, when if I'm on a lower carb because I'm, I'm mixing it up, uh, the BCAAs just help with with that. So it's it's about the breakdown of the, the muscle. It's it's because your body wants to use that first, the, the, um, the muscle for energy. Um, but just when you're on low carbs, concentration can be a bit, bit all over the joint. So I, I find that that um, it helps. And also, look, this is also a bad thing, but they do have flavors in them. So, um, so I don't go have a Mars bar every day. Um, it's just a big bit of that um, flavor in there. Yeah. Um, um, the is just they sort of that anabolic environment after training. Um, and as Matt said too, if you're sort of on a low carb diet. Um, Increasing your protein intake, it, it helps uh, prevent yeah that stripping of uh, muscle mass from your body when you're trying to, to lose a bit of body weight. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, do any of you know if the uh, image enhanced performance and image enhancing drugs have uh, contraindications with some of the medications that we might use, for example, in mental health, antipsychotics, uh, anti antidepressants, anything like that? I don't, and I should because this is a topic that comes up every now and then. Um, I honestly don't know enough about how they're metabolized in the body to be able to support you with that. And, but it's fair enough. If we don't know, we don't know. And I'm more than happy to do some research and get back to the person that asked that. So if the person that asked that wants to flip me their email, then I'm happy. I know they're contraindicated if you may have some psychological um, health matters. Sure. I don't know if the drugs themselves mm. interact with other medications of that nature. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. That, that's what I was thinking as well. There's, there's no, not a particular drug that I can think of, but yeah, the mental health one um, is kind of sprung to mind there too. Cool. And you mentioned in your uh, presentation, Matthew, that uh, somebody might come along and they say, you know, they're only planning on, you know, for example, putting on a couple of kilos, whatever it might be. Um, but then when they get to that point, they then keep going with it. So you know, they don't stop at the point that they've reached their goal. Do these drugs have a dependence uh, issue alongside with them? Or is it more just that psychological uh, recognition of improvement and wanting to keep doing that? Sure. So good question. Um, they're all, all been good questions. But yeah, look, there there is some research out there suggesting that it shares the same pathways as opioids mm. in terms of the reward um, okay. centers and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I don't think there's enough research out there to, to fully support that. I think it is maybe more of a, this is what we think and more research is yeah. needed, but regardless of whether that is or not, I do think it's the psychological thing. That's what I always think about it. My, my background is psychology. So that's where my mind goes to first, yeah. that it is yeah. that, yep, things are looking great. I'm in the mirror. And look, when you're at a gym, you're surrounded by mirrors. You see yourself from every angle. Um, you can see muscles that you didn't know that you had in your back um, that are suddenly starting to show. So it's about that that feedback. And that's why I think a lot of guys now flip from cycling on and off to blast and cruise because they don't, when you stop using these drugs, you do lose a lot of the gains that you put on um, in terms of size. So it's about doing something to keep what you've worked hard to get to. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's the psychological thing that I think of more than the actual biological pathways. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and just with, uh, you obviously gave a shout out to Renee's presentation, which uh, we've also got on our website. I definitely encourage people to have a look at that and the different uh, profiles of people that are using these substances. Do you think that with social media and the way that our world is now, do you think the use of these has increased in recent times? Yeah, definitely. And I think there's been a lot of research looking at this. I know Scott Griffiths at Melbourne has done some some work at, at looking at this. But yeah, look, um, Instagram and all those things. Um, and look at one of the gyms that I go to, I see the guys in between sets will be taking photos of themselves, um, yes. or photos in the mirror. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think some of it is, some people will not get harm from it, others will. Um, and that's why things like Instagram have now stopped showing the number of likes that you get for a photo um, oh. for people seeing that. So social media is recognising that they're a huge part of the problem and are trying to change some of that. Um, but yeah, I think certainly we are seeing that with um, with social media and increasing um, some of these body image issues. Perfect, thank you. Um, I've got another question from someone who will hopefully get in touch with you after this presentation if you don't know them already. I won't read their name out. Um, but I'm just going to read the question because it's wrong. Hi, do you think there will be a treatment program slash clinic for this group in the future? I'm currently undertaking a research study in this group with my staff specialist colleague in Sydney. And this is a question I'm frequently asked by the group. So is that like a specialised treatment? Um, yeah, I'm assuming a specialist treatment facility. Yeah, look, oh God, that's, that's the dream. Uh, there, there was one done, and I want to say in the early 2000s, maybe it was even 2000 in Sydney, they set up a, um, I think it was David Handelsman, who I think is an endo, maybe a GP, sorry if, if I've gotten that wrong, but um, they set up a steroid clinic, and the idea was for a clinic for people to come in, get advice, get help, 
um, all that sort of stuff, a one-stop shop. And it, it folded not long after. And I think it was because firstly, it wasn't no, well known. Uh, secondly, it was still in that time where people really didn't want to talk about using steroids. And look, these guys don't like to talk about using. Um, it does take a bit of coaxing to get them out. But um, people thought that they were prescribing steroids. not um, So the, the clinic didn't work very well. But I think that's something that I get asked. And I think um, that, that really would be the dream is to do something like that. I know they do it in the UK. UK have got great um, resources for this in their, in their health system and dedicated clinics for, um, for these guys. Um, we don't, but I think it's something that we really need to start looking at. But yeah, yeah, yeah. get in contact. It's, it's the dream to do something like that. Can I just add to that, Jim? Um, yeah. I was just going to say, look, that's, that's the voice of a lot of the, the people using these drugs out there that's been going around uh, for the last 20 years that I've been listening as well. Um, but even if it was on the, the case of just being able to have screening done so they can do, the, do this much more safely, they find they can't approach most of their GPs without scrutiny. So yeah. even if it was for that reason, the other big one is, um, look, there's a lot of political factors here and, and you know, there's a lot of things they can't do. And even the blood screening itself, if you speak to a doctor, getting that across, they'd have to pay for that probably because Medicare is not going to pay for it. But the other side is post-cycle therapy. So there's a lot of medications out there that I think, uh, and, and so do the, the other people in this field that are using these drugs, think that they should have access to to help them with a lot of the side effects um, or when they do want to come off, deal with the issues when they come off. And I think that's something that a clinic could provide as well. And that kind of leads to a question. You know, we have... Uh, um, I'm going to sound a bit tokenistic when I say this, but hopefully you get the, the gist of it. So we will have, you know, maybe rainbow flags in the waiting room to allow that community to know that it's a safe place to come. We might have some Indigenous Africa to allow them to know that. What can we do in our clinics and waiting areas and that to uh, let people that use these substances know that it's a safe place to be able to at least open those conversations to start those dialogues? Is there anything you can recommend? I've put my I've thought about this a while because we did Kay um, Stanton Katinka and I wrote something for the Hedden newsletter uh, last year or the year before about how we could do this and Kay's suggestions were things like having some bodybuilding posters in the the waiting room things like that um, I I think and if anyone here is doing something that they think is working by all means please please share. Um, yeah. yeah, this this group, word gets around. People know the safe place to go and the safe person to talk to. So sometimes I think it's just if someone goes to see a health care professional and has a good experience, they will let others know. And I know that you may not want to suddenly become the person that every guy at the gym down the road is coming to see because of all their <laughs> um, the, the concerns that they're having. But just having that network um, people people will figure that, that out themselves. But Richard, you might have some ideas. Yeah, I was just going to say, look, um, they're probably not going to say this to their GP, but in our drug and alcohol services, most of the, the people that I've been brought in to work with, they've been there for other drug use. Um, so please just make sure as a, a clinician, you ask the question, because um, often they, they will disclose it when they're there you know, for, for meth or what it may be. Um, so it does happen. But I think, as Matt said, I mean, there's some encouraging signage um, and having that information available that they can pick up on, whether it's something that might be useful them, to them or not, it still encourages that uh, supportive environment that, hey, we, we deal with this scenario as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. Um, I'll, I'll aim this one at Matthew as you let slip that you have a psych psychology background. Um, do you find that motivational interviewing is a useful tool to have with this cohort? Um, look, my slack days are uh, a while ago, um, <laughs> but however, as I, as I said to Jim, I'm a trained um, smart facilitator, so that's why I'm interested in, in Peter's presentation next week, and I do work with um, men who have sex with men and methamphetamine use, and um, yeah, motivational interviewing works really well with that group. I don't, I don't know how much you can generalise across, um, but yeah, I think... I don't know the literature enough to say what is working with this group or not. And I think it it probably, when we look at the psychological intervention, sits in the body image um, uh, literature or that group that are coming in for that disordered body image. Um, so maybe extrapolating from that 
uh, to this group. But Richard, do you have anything for that? Yeah, I think it would have its place. Uh, just going back to what Matt said in his presentation around it, it's, it's really about harm minimization. You're not very often going to get these guys to stop using. Um, so it, it's looking at how they can reduce their use or turn to safer alternatives, be it uh, a safer drug, uh, safer route of drug. Um, yep. So yeah, I think I think it has a place there. Perfect, thank you. Um, I think my final question, um, I haven't got anything more popping up on the screen, is you've obviously mentioned a lot of resources in your uh, presentation with Renee, um, et cetera, um, Kay Stanton. Is there any web resources or anything that clinicians can access that's going to increase their knowledge in this area in a uh, in a positive way that's also kind of research based and you know proven? Sure. Um, so the one that comes to mind, and look, I'll send this to um, to Jim, and maybe if people want to email me, they can. Um, Katinka van der Ven and a, and a, a group, um, including researchers from the UK and Europe, put together resources for clinicians that's that's web-based. I'm fairly sure that that's accessible. Um, and as I said, I think it's actually linked from the Human Enhancement Drug Network website. So if you just Google that and go to the website, you might, you'll find a range of resources. Um, I know almost every separate NSP is kind of doing their own resource sometimes and different governments are doing their things. So um, look, this could be a, a community of practice here of sharing things, but Richard, do you, have you come into contact with things? Uh, no, not, not a great deal. I, I know that um, our own services put out some, some booklets um, and, and that's what I've sort of utilised with our staff in the past. Um, uh, so that, that's ADIS, is that correct? Have I got yes. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, ADIS produced some uh, steroid resource booklets. Yeah, yeah. So I did a little bit of work with them and a booklet was released some years ago. Uh, and that's what we've been using at our, um, our NSPs and uh, with our drug and alcohol services as well. Perfect, thank you. And I would also recommend the uh, head, I don't know if it's a website, I'm through, I'm on their mailing list and also follow them on Twitter and a few other things. And yeah, the information, of, and I got through, onto that through Richard putting me in touch with Matthew, um, but the information I've gained from that over the recent times is definitely valuable information and it just, you know, just skills me up to feel a bit more confident. And I think that's often what it comes down to. I think that's often why clinicians might not ask those questions is they don't feel they have the confidence to actually be able to provide any information, which is why I really liked, and one of my colleagues who's sitting next to me also really liked Matthew in your slide presentation about recognising that the person sat in front of you is often the person that has the knowledge um, and not being afraid to ask them what they know and be able to learn some of the, you know, the tricks and things that they've been doing in the past. And certainly, you know, as a long-term AOD clinician, most of my AOD knowledge is learned from the AOD clients that will walk through the door that are using illicit substances, if you like. Um, so it makes perfect sense that we should also apply that same technique to people that are using performance and image enhancing drugs. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, I was just gonna say, unfortunately, um, it's a very gray area and there hasn't been a, a lot of research into some of the things that uh, some of these guys tried to deal with and uh, they'll still walk in with a lot of bro science and uh, yes. not have their knowledge quite right and, and I deal with that on a regular basis. Um, anything from the drugs they're using to the effects to this to that. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot don't really understand and they've just taken it on from everybody else and it's just like uh, Chinese whispers unfortunately. And it's just like when I when I used to work on EDRS and I interviewed 100 people every year that would say that they are getting the cheapest but the best drug from their dealer and no one else is. Uh, not everyone can be. Um, and so you'll get it from this group as well that what they're doing is based on their research and their science and it's tried and tested. They go onto the online forums, they'll put their what they're planning to do and people will comment on it. So you are up against some of that sometimes. I don't think that's a bad thing though, but yeah, you just need to be mindful that everyone is doing the best thing um, and uh, yeah, you just got to work with that.